So we talked about exponential growth in bacteria and how it increases very quickly, but lions are not bacteria. Unlike bacteria, lions can only, cannot divide once an hour, but their population can undergo exponential growth. The Gorogoro Crater is a 2,000 foot deep caldera with a 100 square mile floor located at the eastern edge of Tanzania's Serengeti Plain. The crater's cliff walls serve to isolate about 100 lions from their nearby Serengeti counterparts, so there isn't a lot of immigration or emigration. Here is the lion population in the Nagorogar crater. Hypothetical data from 1950 to 1962 is in blue. Real data from 1963 to 1980 is in orange. And our prediction is in red here. Looking at the lion population from 1963 to 1975, so that orange population, do you think this rate of growth will continue to increase? Why or why not? So think about this. It's growing really rapidly. It's a rapid decline. It's growing really rapidly. Will it continue to climb like this for another decade or two? Limiting factors. The previous graph showed exponential growth in the crater lions from 1963 to 1980. However, exponential growth is rarely sustained for a long time in any population. A more realistic population model recognizes the factors that limit population growth. For example, the bacteria in our petri dish would eventually run out of food, preventing them from reproducing uncontrollably. Therefore, food is a limiting factor. Using the picture to the right to get started, brainstorm a list of at least three limiting factors that might affect the lion population in the crater. Well, the first thing I see here that we already talked about is food. Zebras are food for lions. So that's number one. Food. The second thing you can think about is where do lions, zebras, elephants, and other animals that live in the Serengeti Plain where it's pretty dry, where do they have to go, all go at least once every couple of days? Where do you have to go to tank up in the summer if you sweat a lot? You get kind of thirsty? Think about it. What's a limiting factor for uh, animals in a desert or in a very dry environment? So now that you've thought of your three limiting factors, let's talk about logistic growth. It's not exponential growth, it has a limit. The available resources in the crater can support a certain number of lions, just like the petri dish can support a certain number of bacteria. When limiting factors affect population growth, we describe it as logistic growth or an S-curve. You can see how this curve here is exponential for a while, but then it levels off and it kind of shape, it's kind of in the shape of an S. Both density dependent and density independent limiting factors influence the growth of populations. Density dependent factors include food. There's less food if there are more animals. There's less food per animal. There's less space per animal if there are more animals. That's why it's density dependent. Water, there's only so much water per animal, and the more animals, the less water per animal. Disease happens if there's lots of crowding. And predation, the more animals that are kind of living on top of each other, the more they're going to eat each other. For example, a large population of lions would probably decrease if the zebra died out. Well, a small population of lions would probably be okay. Density independent limiting factors include weather. Um, tornadoes don't care how many animals are in a particular population. And natural disasters like floods or earthquakes. Click a point on the graph where you think competition for space was low for the bacteria. So this again is a logistic growth curve for bacteria. Where do you think they're not competing so much for space when there are not so many bacteria and there's kind of a lot of space in the 
petri dish. I'll give you a hint, it's pretty early in the history of the bacteria. I'll let you take a guess. Food is a good example of density deep density dependent limiting factor that could inhibit population growth. What do you think will happen to the rate of lion population after 1980? Will it grow faster and faster or start to slow down? Remember that the lion population was between 75 to 100 individuals before the disease outbreak. When we know about where the population hovers, what do we call that when we, we watch that second video? Take a minute to think. Use the graph to draw your prediction about the lion population from 1980 to 2012. So I think that 75 to 100 is going to be the carrying capacity. So that there, the lion population is going to fluctuate, but it's always going to come kind of between 75 and 100. So it might do something like this. Let's check. The number of individuals an environment can support is called the carrying capacity. So that 75 to 100 was definitely the carrying capacity. The limiting factors determine the carrying capacity, which is generally the highest population that the resources, food, space, water can support. Competition for resources is highest when the population is near capacity. Populations usually grow exponentially in the first half of the log logistic growth and then stabilize as carrying capacity in the second half. So here's where the exponential growth occurs and then it slows down and you kind of reach carrying capacity here. This is the petri dish has no more space for any more bacteria to grow on the agar. So here we're going to draw a line to estimate the carrying capacity of the petri dish. To draw a line we're going to click two points on the graph. Afterwards drag and drop your two points to edit your line. The coordinates for the two points in the table are shown will be shown below. So the coordinates, the x and y coordinates will be shown here. I think it's right around here so I'm going to draw a line from here over to here and we'll check my answer. Lo and behold I was correct. The carrying capacity of the petri dish is about 6,000 bacteria limited by food and space. Here are two data sets from 1952 to 1950 to 1962, that's in blue, and from 1963 to 1980. Remember that the first set is a hypothetical carrying capacity, while the second one, orange, was collected by scientists in the field. On the x-axis, year zero represents 1963 when the study began. Draw a line to estimate the average carrying capacity of the lion's environment prior to the disease outbreak that took place in the 1960s. So if we're going to look at the carrying capacity in the environment prior to the 1960s, so right in here, I think the average is going to lie right in here. So I'm going to click from here to here. Let's see if I'm right. Yeah, wow, I was right on. Cool. So this is what they consider to be the carrying capacity of the lions before 1963, before that disease outbreak. Here's our prediction about the lion population from page 11. Does our old prediction look, does it look different than what we might have been expecting? Use what you know now about carrying capacity, redraw a new prediction of the lion population after 1963. Well, I still think it's going to be around the carrying capacity, but maybe it'll be a little bit lower because the carrying capacity was between 75 and 100. So I'll draw my curve maybe a little bit lower. And I know climate change is affecting Africa, so that might be a factor as well.
Here is the actual data from the next 20 years. As you may notice, the real population data isn't as perfectly shaped as the population, as the bacterial population growth we saw. Real populations often fluctuate as the limiting factors change from year to year and may stabilize after several generations. Wow, it kind of sank a little bit more. I wonder what caused the decline here. So compare my prediction to the real data. What do I notice? Are there differences? Can I suggest some causes? Well, um, it's a little bit lower. Um, maybe drought had affected the crater, or maybe there was another disease outbreak. Or maybe there were some lion poachers that came in and took a bunch of uh, lions. I don't know. Let's find out. The population decreased below the 70 to 90 lion average carrying capacity of the crater before 1963. As previously mentioned, density dependent limiting factors were thought to include food, space, shelter, water, disease, and predation. The limiting factors that determine the carrying capacity of the crater may be different than they were 50 years ago, thereby changing the carrying capacity. Which of the following is a density independent limiting factor that could cause fluctuations in the carrying capacity between 1995 and today? Well, I mentioned it earlier. Um, whether it rains or not doesn't matter how many animals, um, how many animals are in a population doesn't affect whether it rains or not. So that is a big hint in choosing the correct answer there. Now let's apply what we've learned about bacteria and lions population growth to humans. Here are three different growth curves for human population growth. This is the highest model predicted by the United Nations. This is kind of the medium growth model, and this would be the lowest United Nations predicted model. Given the shape of these graphs, do you think Earth's population will reach a carrying capacity? What might be some limiting factors? What do you think will happen if we do reach carrying capacity? So this kind of requires you to pause the video and do some thinking. It depends on which model might be correct. For this model, I think we definitely would reach carrying capacity if we continue to grow at that rate. That's a little bit scary. We might run out of some things like food or water or space. Congratulations, you've learned about exponential growth, logistic growth, carrying capacity, and density dependent and density independent limiting factors. You've made predictions, interpreted graphs, and applied population models to real data sets. You're now prepared to answer the questions from the beginning of the activity. Which one did you choose? What factors can influence how populations change over time? What is the difference between exponential and logistic growth? How can we po apply population models to real world data? That was the UN data we just talked about. What inferences can we make about the human population? So take some time, do some thinking, and write your answer. Now that you've done some thinking about population models, um, we're done, except there's one more thing you need to think about. Fortunately, we live in Minnesota, and we have Dr. Craig Packer from the University of Minnesota who did this research on lions right here I believe he works on the St. Paul campus of the University of Minnesota, which happens to be pretty close to my house. Um, if you're interested in learning more about uh, Dr. Packer's research, you can check out the article from National Geographic. There's also a scientific paper you can look at. Thanks so much for watching.